Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to an introduction to Apache Kafka. My name is Kate Stanley. Thank you so much for coming to my talk today. This is the third talk that I've given um, on Kafka at this event. So as you can probably guess, I'm really excited about Kafka. I think it's a really great technology. The community is growing really fast. Um, so it's definitely one to check out. Um, so just a very quick show of hands. Who here has attended a talk about Kafka before? A couple of people. Who has actually run Kafka themselves? Okay, and who's done more than just start it, but actually start writing up some applications to produce and consume? Not many. Okay, cool. So what I'm going to do is, in the next 15 minutes, basically give you an idea of what Kafka is about and some of the key terms that you need to know if you want to start building apl applications that use Kafka yourself. So Apache Kafka is an open source distributed streaming platform. It is becoming the de facto event streaming platform. As I said, the community is growing every single day. And it provides publish and subscribe to streams of events. It allows you to store events in a durable way and process streams of events as they occur. So that's kind of the headline news. So Whenever I talk about Kafka, one of the first questions I get, especially coming from IBM, so I work on a product called IBM Event Streams, which is fully supported Kafka, but at IBM we also have something called MQ. So people always ask me what's the difference between message queuing and event streaming, um, or what's the difference between MQ and IBM Event Streams. So I'm going to give you a definition so that you can see where these two technologies um, make the most sense. And it doesn't mean that you can't do a bit of message queuing with Kafka or a bit of event streaming-ish with MQ, but it just means these are where they are best suited. So message queuing has transient data persistence. So if you've ever run any message queuing system, you'll know that you put messages onto a queue and once someone has read the message, it is no longer on the queue. So it's transient data persistence. It's targeted reliable delivery. So there's a lot of things built into these kinds of message queuing systems to make sure I'm getting my message directly to you. And because of that, it's more aimed at sort of request reply type scenarios. Event streaming, on the other hand, relies heavily on stream history. So being able to replay events, which is something you just don't get with a message queuing system. It provides scalable consumption. So tools like Kafka are built to have many, many, many different consumers of that data. And the data is immutable. So there's a fundamental difference between how we're structuring the thing that we're putting on a message queue versus an event stream. A message, in this case, is more of, I want you to do this thing. An event is a statement of something that happened, and so it's immutable. You can't change it later, and the event streaming platforms won't let you change it later. To illustrate this at an even deeper level, I'm going to talk about what's actually happening under the covers a little bit, so you can see, because to often message queuing systems will say they do publish subscribe, but it is done in a different way. So for point-to-point -point messaging, you have your queue, and all of your applications that are sending new messages are always appending to the end of the queue. And if you connect one or more consumers, they then pull messages off the queue. The key thing here is you will see there is only one line from each different message. So between all of the consumers, they will get each message once. But you can't have multiple consumers getting the same messages. If you want to do that, you have to create a copy of the whole queue and then go from there. Publish subscribe is different in its approach. So you have something called a topic, which is the equivalent of the queue. Again, you're always putting events onto the end, but here you have a subscription. So your subscription then gets a copy of every single event. The actual topic itself hasn't been copied, but the subscription can get a copy of each one. Then from your subscription, you can have consumers either sharing the same subscription, so they would share the events, or one consumer per subscription, so they get every event. So these are the properties that you have as part of Apache Kafka. It is an event streaming system. You get that stream history. It's specifically targeted for scalable consumption, and you'll see how that's achieved. It's immutable data, so those events going onto that topic 
they go there and then that's the order and that's how they should stay. And Kafka itself is scalable and highly available as well. So this is a kind of picture that I like to use showing all the things in the Kafka ecosystem. Because we are short on time today, I'm only going to be talking about the producers, consumers, and the cluster in more detail. But there is Kafka Streams, which does stream processing, and Kafka Connect for connecting to other systems that you can also have a go with. So let's first have a look at producers and how you get data into Kafka. Now, the best starting point for running Kafka is this quick start guide. If you go to kafka.apache.org slash quick start, it's basically got a bunch of steps for you to run. The really nice thing about Kafka is when you download it, it comes with shell scripts to help you start it up and to do admin tasks. So that's really great. So you download that, get started. But you can also write um, some producers and consumers. So Kafka itself comes with a Java API. That doesn't mean you only have to use Java. There are loads of other languages that have supported Kafka clients, but the Java ones are built into Kafka by default. Every time a new release of Kafka happens, you get a new release of these producers consumers. So it means they're kind of all up to date with the latest features. So we've had a look at the quick start, and we know that we can write um, our apps, and we can start to use the quick start to send the messages in, or we can use the Kafka producer. So first, we have to decide what we're going to send into Kafka. Um, we start with an event. So an event or a record in Kafka is what we're going to be sending onto the topic. And that is made up of a key and value pair. The key is optional the value is required. So when I'm going to send a new event, if I want to, I can use this shell script. So this is what the quick start will be using. And you run Kafka console producer, you provide a broker list, and you provide a topic. And then you get your messages sent in. So there are four things that you have to do if you want to get started producing to Kafka. First one, choose a topic. So you can see there I put dash dash topic is test. I've also had to tell it where Kafka is, but I'm not counting that as a step. Um, for the topic, it's up to you how you decide which events go to which topics. Um, so because applications will produce consume to a single topic, it makes sense that if one application is dealing with one type of events, that it all writes to the same topic. But it's up to you to define what that is. Once you've chosen a topic, you then have to decide whether to use a key. Now, the key is used to route the events into Kafka slightly differently. And I will talk about a little bit more about how that works a little bit later. So you've chosen your topic. You have to decide whether to use a key. If you're starting off, just don't use a key. Just use a value. You don't need the key at first. But later, you might want to consider it. Next, you have to choose an acknowledgement level. So for your producers, you can have three acknowledgement levels. And this is basically how sure do you want to be that your event has ended up in Kafka. The first one is fire and forget. So if you set it to zero, you're basically saying, I don't really care what happens to this event. If something goes wrong, don't tell me about it. I'm not interested. If you're putting, say, sensor data, so a temperature that gets updated every second, Probably zero is fine. It's really fast. You can get lots of data through. Maybe you don't mind if you miss a few events. Number one means it waits for one breaker. You'll see what that means a little bit later. But basically, it means you're sure that the event did get to Kafka and that Kafka thinks it has it. There's still a chance it could vanish if something were to go wrong, but you have a higher level of certainty than you do with zero. And all basically waits to make sure that Kafka has not only received the event, but has stored it away in a way that is more fault tolerant. So if you really care about those events, you need to be setting it to all. Then you have to choose whether to retry. You can set it to zero for don't retry. Obviously, that means you might lose messages, because if you try and send an event and it fails, you haven't retried, you've lost your event or you can set it to retry. Generally in Kafka, most people will set it to retry, but that does risk having duplicates. Because if the first one actually did succeed and then you send another one, 
then you're in trouble. There is, um, you can have an idempotent producer in Kafka, so you, sending the same event twice, you won't end up with it actually duplicated, but that's only for Kafka streams. So these are the four things you need to do in order to produce. Okay, let's talk about consuming the other sites. So you've sent all of these lovely events to Kafka and you want to get them out again. Receiving an event, again, you can use this shell script here. Um, so this is the one in the quick start. I've had to tell it uh, localhost 9092 again, so that's just where Kafka is running. And I've given it a topic. So the first thing to decide is choose a topic. You should probably choose a topic that has some events on it, but it's up to you to choose whichever topic you want. And you'll notice that these two are independent. So one of the things you get from Kafka is you are putting a sort of buffer and a separation between your producers and your consumers. So the producers shouldn't know how many consumers are connected. They independently decide where to put their data and where to pull it from. Once you've chosen a topic, you get to choose where to start. So you'll see here I've put dash dash from dash beginning. By default, a consumer that's run from this shell script will just start at the end of the topic and then any new events that come in, it will read from there. But the really nice thing about Kafka is you can replay events and you can choose where your consumers connect. So you can have multiple different consumers all reading from the same topic, all from different places. So you have to decide where to start. You then have to choose how to manage your offsets. So I said earlier that this number, where you're starting from, that's your offset. If your application goes down and it's a consumer, when it comes back up, it needs to know where to carry on from. Because probably you don't want to go back to where you started because you've already looked at those events. So what you do is you store your offsets in Kafka. You tell Kafka where you got to, so when your app dies, or if your app dies, and it comes back up, it can pick up where it left off. You can do this automatically, so that'll just be sort of underlying on a timer, but that can risk that you end up rereading events, or you can take more control and do it manually in a synchronous or asynchronous manner. The final thing is to pick a consumer group. So as consumers, like I showed earlier, you can have more than one working together to read from a subscription. So between all of the consumers in that group, they get all of the events. You do this by supplying an ID. You have to supply an ID when you connect. So you need to decide if you're going to be part of an existing group or part of a new group. So we've produced and we've consumed, and we know what things we need to start thinking about to do both of those. So let's talk about the cluster itself and what's going on under the cover so you can better understand what you're doing. A Kafka cluster is made up of a number of brokers. Normally you would start with three, that's a good starting point. It's a distributed system. Three allows you to have some failover, which we will see. Now, so far I haven't mentioned partitions. So a topic in Kafka is split up into one or more partitions. So when you're sending your events in, you're actually sending them to a specific partition. Which partition they go to depends on the key that you picked earlier. So if you don't pick a key, it will just round robin. If you do pick one, it goes to the same one each time. And that allows you to have ordering within that partition. The partitions are also spread out, so this gives you scalability because you can scale out your producers to push to the different brokers and your consumers in your group will pull from different brokers as well. This is how we get scalability, but we also have fault tolerance in Kafka. And that's done using replication. So for a particular topic and a particular partition within that topic, you have an elected leader broker. So all of your producers and consumers will talk directly to the leader, but under the covers, what Kafka will do is copy all of these events onto other brokers as well as replicas. So these are the follower brokers. What this means is you now have your data spread out across these different brokers. If your leader goes down, all Kafka has to do is have a leader election, vote in a new leader, and all of your producers and consumers will magically switch across. If you actually try this yourself and run multiple Kafkas locally and connect to producers, consumers, and start killing off the brokers, you'll see the, the producers and consumers will sometimes get a bit unhappy and say they can't really connect, but they'll get told where to read and connect and then they can carry on. But you do need to think about this happening and make sure you've built some fault-tolerant handling into your producers and consumers. 
So that's a very quick overview of Kafka. There are a lot of new terms to be aware of, um, but the best thing to do is go try it for yourself. So have a go at that quick start. I've linked to Connect and Streams if you do want more information about those, and the Event Streams Connector links basically allow, gives you different connectors you can use with Kafka Connect to connect to other systems. And if you are interested more in the product that I work on, which is a fully supported Kafka with other capabilities built on top, you can check out the IBM Biz link at the bottom. Thank you very much.